technology where uh, one employs various methods to understand the complement of proteins and their modifications and their interactions. And these interactions actually have become more and more, uh, I would say, uh, coming to the forefront of understanding various biological phenomena. And I'm going to dwell on this a little bit later. So uh, the uh, most important fact that one is to uh, remember and has become uh, appreciated more recently, and that too after large number of genomes were sequenced, starting from the human genome, is that we have a very limited number of genes. Okay, The gene pool is quite limited. Unlike what people thought before the human genome sequencing projects, we don't have hundreds and thousands of genes coding for the complexity that you see. Our genome encodes for at the most uh, 21,000 protein coding genes, okay, and some other uh, genes. But basically, the lim coding capacity is very limited. And if you compare other species, which are evolutionary, much low complexity and much earlier in time scale, also do not have many, uh, I would say, orders of magnitude less number of genes. In fact, if you compare fruit fly, versus human genome, the number of genes is, uh, one would expect in terms of the complexity, many orders of magnitude higher, but it's not even twice, okay? So the number of genes is actually comparable between these two seemingly extremely distant species with huge difference in the complexity of bodily functions, the uh, entire uh, makeup of the body, the developmental program, as well as the uh, even morphology, if you see, is so different. So the reason being that uh, it doesn't matter if we have a limited number of coding capacity in terms of genes. What actually matters is ultimately how that information is used or translated. And that's where proteins come into picture. So the size of the proteome actually is much larger, several times larger. It's like a balloon that you inflate much bigger and bigger. So that a bigger and bigger balloon actually grows because the proteins that are encoded by the genome through limited number of genes can actually get inflated into much bigger coding capacity through large number of changes, which are post-translational. So of course there is modifications of the proteins, which are the covalent modifications. And for epigenetics, of course, they are very, very important and briefly touch upon that. And then you also have other mechanisms like alternative splicing. So um, highly evolved genes have uh, multiple splitting events, so large number of introns and exons. So through the combinations of this, through the permutations and combinations, you can generate number of different uh, rearranged genes and therefore different proteins. And of course, there are protein modifications. And above all of these, the splicing and the modifications, there is also a possibility of proteins forming different complexes, which are again permutations and combinations because protein A may complex with B or C or D or A or B or C or A or D. So you can imagine so many different types of combinations of interactions of proteins. I'll give you an example of one most recent article published just last month, which actually deals with this aspect of interactions of proteins, and it's mind-boggling. Even if you take just two cell lines or treat cell line A with something and make it A prime and compare the proteome of the two, you will find huge differences. And the difference actually in terms of numbers can be astronomical, huge numbers. So that is mind boggling and I'm going to give you some data and uh, some glimpses into this because that's how the science has evolved over the last few decades from genomics to proteomics. And of course, together, this information content is so rich and so huge that is enabling us to understand very complex biological phenomena. So therefore, using proteomics and the tools of proteomics, we need to know all protein-protein interactions and of course, one protein or its peptides uh, or smaller peptides like insulin and many other such small peptides may have multiple functions depending upon the context, depending upon their modifications, depending upon their uh, multimerization, oligomerization status, all kinds of things. Depending upon one phosphorylation, proteins may dimerize or not dimerize. 
or they may form heteromeric complexes with other proteins which regulate the function of the proteins so that's the next aspect so we need to understand this important aspect of regulation of protein function their modifications which can also change the locations of proteins okay phosphorylation can drive change from one nuclear compartment to another nuclear compartment from inside of the er to outside of the er from outside to inside from uh, cytoplasm to nucleus proteins keep on shuttling between the nuclear uh, uh, between the subcellular compartments and that's very essential for their function because if they are in a wrong compartment it's like sequestering those things okay till the time they get into the correct compartment where the site of action is so many transcription factors for example are in the cytoplasm where they do not play much role depending upon the signal all those cues translate into some modifications or some interactions that drive the protein inside the nucleus and in the nucleus they will function whatever they are supposed to do either activate gene expression or interact with some other protein to modulate some other aspect of gene expression so this is how uh, proteins function and that's why their de detection and quantitation methodologies which are the basic tools of proteomics are extremely uh, 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 i would say important in this aspect one of the major reasons why these technologies have improvised over the last few decades especially in the last decade is because unless you change the detection limit you will not be able to accommodate the rare uh, events proteins that are not very highly abundant because the range is actually huge if you look at the proteins and their concentrations intracellularly it can change by almost uh, 10 orders of magnitude okay and that's why you need zeptomol sensitivity sometimes to detect proteins which are in very very small quantities okay so because of such huge or uh, i would say diversity in the numbers okay from few to millions and billions of copies per cell okay proteins can vary so much and of course all of them are equally important you can't say that protein that is in million copies is uh, more important than those which are in just a few hundreds of copies all have their own function their own roles to play and that's why we have to invent technologies we have to kind of uh, be upfront so that uh, we can improvise the detection limits and quantitation methodologies to encompass this entire spectrum of low abundance and very high abundance proteins and the whole range in between so what are the challenges um, as i said the dynamic range is one of the complex uh, challenges and then also the protein is very dynamic highly complex the relative protein abundances can differ by several orders of magnitude so these are the main challenges in the technology so the proteomics aims to analyze the levels and structure of all proteins present in a cell Sanjay, or a tissue sorry in, uh, yes sorry have you enabled the uh, in oh uh, presentation mode i'm not able yes. to see it yes. you can't okay, see my fine. slide no no i i think it's some from from my end are others able to see sanjeev slides Can in you? a full screen mode ha not not screen. moving slides are not moving Oh. Well, it is visible, but no movie. It's at slide one. It's a still. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, you can't because I can see it in my screen. Okay. Uh, you can't see the si slide title "Proteomics: The Challenge." Yes, we. Uh, no, we can't see that. Oops. <laughs> I don't know how to change that. Let me stop sharing and share again. Yeah, maybe you could yes. just re-share again, Sanjeev. Yes. Re-share and put yeah. it on slideshow mode. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Can you see this now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, good that you told me about this. Uh, because the, for these slides, it's okay. But for those where there are images and data, it will be good to see those pictures. So uh, the aim of proteomics is to analyze the levels and structure of all proteins present in a cell or a tissue, including their post-translational modifications. So the approaches include protein identification, their quantitation, differential analysis, analysis of protein-protein interactions, their post-translational modifications, which are again uh, huge uh, 
numbers of those modifications exist. Uh, so far, over 200 different types of chemical modifications are known to exist on proteins, some of which are again very abundant and some of them are rare, but each of them have their own unique role. So you can add basically all kinds of chemical moieties to proteins. And the job of proteomics is also to detect quantitatively all these proteins as well as their species so that you can distinguish between different modifications. And then finally, structural proteomics. So uh, the various types include uh, mass spectrometry based proteomics, which is the most common one. And I'm going to give you examples of these. Uh, array based proteomics, which is not as common. And of course, informatics is a very important part of this because without that, you can't use uh, uh, any of the data that comes out of this. The new frontier actually has been the single cell proteomics, um, which is really the new frontier. Uh, people are now coming up with data using uh, proteomic analysis of single cells. It is being refined and becoming more and more sensitive. So just like single cell transcriptomics, which I guess Raja will talk about, there is also single cell proteomics. And now people are also trying to think about ways and algorithms by which one can merge these data sets together, analyze them together, so that you can actually view the entire cell together in terms of its coding capacity, as well as the proteins that perform the functions. And then finally, some of the applications through clinical proteomics, which is again very important because now eventually uh, one has to use this for biomarker identification and also finally in the lab where it can be used as a diagnostic or a prognostic tool for various disorders. So uh, what are the established and emerging proteomic technologies? So this I took from a very uh, nice recent review published in Cell Systems. Uh, again, combining genetics, genomics, to proteomics. So uh, the title of this paper was Proteomic White Systems Genetics to Identify Functional Regulators of Complex Traits. So through genetics, we can understand the genetics of complex traits uh, through genomics. But then you also need to understand how that changes the uh, function of a protein. So uh, like uh, another example I can give just uh, maybe uh, Two days ago, a paper was published in Nature Communications where they talked about thalassemia and you know thalassemia is a genetic condition. So here, point mutants lead to a disease, but point mutants here does not change the protein. Okay, uh, The globin genes are not changed. The new mutation that they found by looking at some of the patients actually is in a so-called uh, silent region of the gene in one of the non-coding uh, non elements. And after careful analysis through genomic analysis, they actually figured out that this particular uh, SNV, single nucleotide change, actually turns that region into a promoter, okay, which otherwise it wasn't. And this new promoter drives expression of a new gene, new protein uh, through mRNA. But what actually does it, it also interacts with the globin promoter, uh, sorry, globin enhancer. So the protein regulation, genomic regulation goes hand in hand, you know. And in this case, they actually showed that this dialogue between the new promoter and the enhancer in an orientation dependent manner actually represses globin transcription, which leads to thalassemia. So there are so many such studies that are coming out where you look at this very complex interaction between the genome and proteome and uh, uh, regulatory elements and how they regulate functions, complex functions, to understand very complex biological uh, phenomena such as diseases, many disorders. Uh, of course, technically, there are a uh, number of new inventions that are coming out, some new papers in the last few years. This is a paper from 2018, which talks about nanopots. Okay. So now everything is getting miniaturized. You know, you have microfluidics for genomics. People are using that extensively, especially single cell work. And same is true with proteomics now. So uh, this is a platform for nano droplet processing for deep and quantitative profiling using very few cells. So you can imagine they have perfected this technology for 10 to 100 mammalian cells. Okay. So pictorially it is shown here how one does it using a module where you have glass slides and two chambers. And there is a pattern slide which has nano wells in which you put individual cells and then they get digested uh, for proteomic analysis as shown here. So these are the nanopods 
used for uh, analyzing proteomes of individual cells. So this is single cell work at its uh, best way of doing it. And this is again another uh, platform for single cell proteomics by mass spectrometry, scope 2. And again, you will see that in a uh, very tiny container, nano wells, you can actually prepare the samples, barcode it, and then the barcoded peptides are sequenced using mass spectrometry and uh, quantified. And finally, you can get the data out. So it's very important that now you have uh, taken proteomics even further. Of course, sensitivity of mass spectrometers has increased, so you can detect very small amounts of the proteins. But then, of course, if you increase the sensitivity further, you can take proteins from a single cell rather than population of cells because the modifications, the complexes of proteins may be different from one cell to another cell. Okay, So the heterogeneity of the cells, which you see in not just primary tissues like white blood cells, there are different types of cells. And uh, each T cell may not be alike the other T cell in the blood. Similarly, even in tissues or, for example, disease tissues, cancer tissues, inside of the cancer tissue, one cell may not be like the other cell, even neighboring cell. So there is a lot of heterogeneity. And this heterogeneity is understood now at the level of transcriptomes as well as at the level of proteomes because of advent of technologies like this. And this is very important because unless you understand such heterogeneity, you will not be able to comment on what actually is going on. And even for looking at action of, uh, for example, drugs against tumors or some other uh, diseases, you need to understand how they are actually targeting this heterogeneous population. And under that, if you are able to quantitate the effects, then that would give you a much better understanding of what exactly is going on. So uh, I will not go through this. Uh, I want to quickly come to, uh, because I'm also conscious about the time, uh, some last few approaches and applications of uh, high-end proteomics. So this one is, is closer to my uh, interest because uh, this talks about histone modifications. So it's also important for any person, uh, let's say, like me, who is interested in understanding the epigenetic regulation. So it's important to know what kind of modifications exist on histones. So traditionally, using chip sequencing and other methodology or genomic techniques, using antibodies against individual modifications, let's say histone H3 uh, acetylation or methylation, one can understand the occupancy of those modifications on specific nucleosomes across loci in a genome-wide fashion. But now more and more new modifications are coming up, you know, and these modifications are not just important for just activation and repression of gene expression, but many of these new modifications okay, are actually important for communicating or transmitting signals from multiple different signaling pathways to chromatin. Because ultimately, chromatin is the orchestrator of whatever the cell is perceiving from the outside world. All the signaling pathways finally impinge upon chromatin. Something changes that switches the gene circuits on and off. So these circuits and their connections need to be understood. So for that, one has to have a clear idea about how many different types of modifications can be put onto the histones by different signals. And these signals could be metabolic signals. And in fact, that is the new frontier now. People are trying extensively to understand how metabolic uh, or the metabolites are actually signaling to genes. Okay, so metabolites through diet, through uh, many other parameters, lifestyle, how they change, and ultimately how that changes activities of genes that can lead to either two outcomes, either health, which is the good outcome, or a bad outcome, which is disease. So high-end technologies in genomics and proteomics together are actually allowing us to enable understanding of these kind of complex phenomena. So in this case, what these people have done is to identify and quantify histone post-translational modifications in bulk, okay? Not targeted, not like only histone methylation or only histone acetylation. Any modification that may occur. So of course, for that, you have to have a discovery approach. You can't take a targeted approach. So what they have done is using bottom-up, middle-down, and top-down technologies using proteomic uh, ways. So by digesting and analyzing the peptides that come out of those digests, 
you can see that schematically here. So these peptides with various decorations of modifications can be then analyzed through various technologies by separating those peptides and then ordering them according to their uh, masses. And then finally, identifying those peptides, assign them so that you can eventually go back and say that, hey, in these conditions, there are so many different modifications that are there. And of course, in a quantified fashion, phosphorylation, so much, acetylation, so much, etc. Riboxylation, uh, even uh, other modifications, lipid modifications, perox. I mean, so many. In this fashion, because in the other methods, which are like, for example, immunoprecipitation based, it is heavily dependent on the availability of antibody as well as the quality of the immunoprecipitation. So those limitations are taken out for, by this approach, where you basically undergo a discovery based approach to understand each and every modification in a quantified fashion. So this is a very popular technology now and very powerful also because it gives you understanding of all modifications in a quantitative manner. You can have two, three conditions, different types of cells, perform this analysis and understand exactly what they're doing. This is another very interesting study that is a very recent study. Uh, we do uh, study cancer biology and in that it's not just histone modifications, but also other modifications which are very important. So in this case, this particular study is about a uh, human cancer cell phosphoproteome. Uh, phosphorylation is a very key modification, okay, especially for many of the signaling pathways that start all over from the cell surface, from the membrane, and then a series of reactions, kinase and the kinase kinase reactions ultimately drive this signaling process inwards in the cytoplasm and then something happens there which is the outcome of that signaling process so characterization of the phosphoproteome because that is what will give you an insight into the signaling pathways and their activity is very important so how do comprehensively one can do that so these technologies have now gone in a completely different way not just 1d okay L the classical L lcms that is a 1d approach but then you also can have a 2d approach as well as a 3d approach as shown here schematically. I will not go into the details of these because uh, it's highly technical, but one must know that the sophistication is now available at all these levels. And then you can use that to quantitatively map the proteome. So here, what they have done is you see heat maps. So the scale is on the right hand side. You can see quantitatively from a scale of zero to 1600, you can see on the top, it's a phosphoproteome of HeLa cell line and uh, panel B bottom shows you K562. So you have compared the phosphoproteome of two different cell lines, okay, using the 2D and 3D approach. And the color code basically shows you the quantity, okay. So the red ones are the highest expressed and the black or the gray ones are the lowest. So in a nutshell, you get a picture of the phosphoproteome under different conditions. And then what is the difference across two cell lines? Okay, the top one versus the bottom one. So using this kind of representation, one can get a picture. And of course, genomic scientists, the transcriptomics, you always see pictures like this, various types of clusters, heat maps, etc. But now proteomics is also catching up. You know, you are going to see this kind of pictures more and more. And of course, you can compare this even with the transcriptome and other uh, gypsy kind of approaches because you have highly quantified data sets, which can be lined side by side to get a complete picture of a cell. It's like a snapshot of a cell with respect to its entire RNA expression and protein expression and then modification content. And finally, this paper I, was, I mentioned in the beginning that it's the interactions of the proteins that is also very important. So this is one of the tour the force approach. You can imagine the amount of work these people must have done. They have done more than 15,000 immunoprecipitation reactions just for this one paper, okay? From two different cell lines, they're comparing here, HEK293D cells, human embryonic carcinoma cells, and human, uh, human colon carcinoma cells, HCD116, two different types of cells. And they have uh, looked at, so one is cancerous, other one is not. One is more epithelial, other one is turned into a, a transformed cell. 10,000 IPs from HEK and more than 5,500 from HCD have been compared so, so that one can evolve the network of association of proteins 
their complexes between these two conditions. Okay, so they performed affinity purification followed by mass spectrometry to be able to understand what are the core complexes of proteins and they actually found out that despite having so much difference in the phenotype of the cell lines, the core complexes were almost identical between these two cell types. Okay, which is quite amazing to see, you know, that the core machinery has not changed because these are human cells, the core machinery does not need to change and that is more like the housekeeping function as we call it, okay, for the cells. But then it's also important to see under specialized conditions what happens. So using network remodeling, they actually figured out what are those special complexes which are different between the two. So that is the differential complex formation. Uh, using that, one can then figure out in terms of phenotypic level, what could be different in the cancerous cell line versus the not cancerous cell line. So this is the dual proteomic scale network model that revealed that there is a remodeling of the human interactome when cells change their phenotype, when they become more cancerous. So this is uh, where I would like to stop because uh, I think we are over time and um, I, this is exactly the kind of flavor I want to give all of you about the state of art, where exactly proteomics has reached from understanding the protein identity to its modifications, to its abundance, and now also the interactions between different proteins that ultimately make the uh, various functioning of the cell come to life. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Sanjeev, for summarizing the recent advances in proteomics. And uh, clearly, uh, the next renaissance, I think, is going to come from proteomics leading to interactome. And yeah. perhaps, I mean, I think this, this will usher in the new systems biology approach where we can probably, uh, I mean, get information from genomics and proteomics and then see, you know, how uh, all of this uh, leads to the cell doing its function. Uh, we, uh, we have... Uh, if we have time for one question, we'd just like to take that and then probably we'll move on to Raja's talk. Uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Somnath Karmakar. What is the role of pH in protein protein interactions and ultimately protein expression? Uh, yeah, I mean, intracellular pH, if one is looking at, um, uh, I, I guess that's what you mean, um, will affect number of events in the cell. Uh, it's very complex actually uh, and there is micro scale changes in the pH that are constantly happening in the cell even in lysosomes versus ER, Golgi in different compartments so and of course in cytosol so that will lead to different affinities of proteins because pH will ultimately uh, ionize the uh, uh, side chains of amino acids in different ways that will change their interactions their hydrophobicity everything will change and of course, it will also change the um, charge on the various modifications, which will lead to because certain modifications are important for certain types of interactions of proteins. So if pH changes, obviously, that will change all of these interactions. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot, Sanjeev. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, moving on, our next speaker is Dr. Raja Mugasi Mangalam. Uh, he's the CEO and founder of Genotypic uh, Technologies. Uh, India's first uh, genomics-based company. Uh, um, they are uh, perhaps the largest service providers and, um, and are very soon moving into other domains like agricultural, bio, diagnostics, and pharma. Uh, I mean, just to give a sense of how big this company is, they've been part of over 6,000 research projects, uh, greater than 500 publications, 50 patents, and 25 products already in the market. Uh, Dr. Raja is also the founder of Qtelomics, uh, and uh, he did his PhD from Madurai Kamaraj University uh, and then did his postdoc at the Weizmann Institute and at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Research Institute, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Uh, and uh, so today he'll be talking about the history of genomics and the role in proteomics. Uh, over to you, Dr. Raja. Yeah, thank you, Bhavna. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, all of you. I think it's running late. Uh, I hope I'll get to the genomic speed. Um, and thank you, Professor Kannan. Um, I'll maybe add a bit. Uh, uh, Kannan was my biochemistry teacher 
in uh, Pune University before I moved to uh, MKU. I was also at Argonne National Lab, uh, Human Genome Project. Uh, that part also I will tell, but I'll be try to tell the history in a very short waves. So, see, genomics, as you know, it's a uh, it started when people moved from slab gels to the ABI slab gels, that's radioactive gels to color gels. Uh, then the Human Genome Project started. I was in the Human Genome Project, the technology development time. Um, then new scripts were being written from the software side, new dice were made, new machines made, almost everything is new. Like every, every day, sometimes we see some exciting things coming. It's a huge project. Then it moved from there to capillary sequences, which are still being used. Whereas the slab gels are gone. I don't think anyone does any colored slab gel or radioactive slab gel unless they're doing some experiments for some other purposes. So those days, a 2KB gene, if you sequence, you get your PhD. Actually, many people in my university were upset that I sequenced some 14, 15 people's clones in just a week's time because we had huge battery of uh, sequencers, slab gels, ABI slab gels. Um, it changed, dramatically it changed. Uh, then people said you have to uh, uh, clone and sequence was the molecular biology. Then it became clone and express your proteins. Then only you'll get your PhD. So it was a really a bold move. Um, I think you all know better. Sequencing a 3GB human genome worldwide, I think maybe 1,000 research groups were there. And uh, in Israel, we were sequencing chromosome 22, the smallest uh, chromosome, while our group was involved in technology development uh, on genomics. I'm sure you all know this. This is the uh, classical... Uh, This is the classical radioactive gels here, here, uh, which I'm just trying to do a option. See here, you read it manually and write down the basis, uh, and uh, then move to four color. Uh, technology actually it's not really color it's a wavelength differences um, that is what changed and human genome became uh, practical um, then came other DNA sequencing but the real history of genomics and father of genomics is actually an unsung hero he was my next door lab mate professor Andrei Mizabekov he moved from Russia to Oregon National Lab, and that was called DNA sequencing by hybridization. So you have a hexamer sitting on a glass slide. Each one, I know the sequence of it. Now you take a small piece of DNA, color the DNA, and then uh, throw it on this glass slide. So whatever spots pick up, then you can stitch them. Okay, this is GAATTC. Then it's AATCG, like that you can stitch. It was an amazing thing. And it was radioactive that time. And uh, whenever I get bored, I go and see and talk with uh, Andrei Mizabakov, who's also a reasonably good chess player. We used to have uh, whiskey with him in the evening, and he has usually has vodka. So he was the inventor of microarray. He was also the inventor of sequencing on a slide. But I don't think anyone even talks about him. He unfortunately passed away, I think, some three years ago. So Affymetrix took his idea, actually. And uh, they, they, were, uh, they tried it, and then they converted into a gene expression method. Illumina's method of sequencing is also coming from here. So if anyone wants to ask you who is the father of genomics, I think it's Professor Andrei Mirzabakov. Um, he ran out of Russia during Cold War time and came to Argo National Lab. I think even this method was developed in Russia, not in USA. So this is called DNA sequencing by hybridization. Um, 
we also tried it by the way uh, but we were doing some other technology uh, we hybridized but by you we use polymerase we were just hybridizing so the idea is very simple even for proteins we can do that that time also we were talking about proteins so here you know the, each arrow here is a is a spot of an oligo and whichever spot lights up then you know this is gaattc this is aattc g like that so you can stitch it that is where actually genomics started because with sanger you never can talk genomics so what is genomics it is just high throughput molecular biology 100 million sequence reads you can get 1 million oligos can be spotted on a glass slide of your the sequence which you want see these were not present uh, until 20 years ago thousands of pcrs of nanoliter volumes can be done but basics is molecular biology it's only you are doing in high throughput all are ultra low price per base unbelievable like it's not even one paisa per base. If you make one million oligos on a glass slide, it's not even a paisa per oligo, if not a base. But genomics is an enabling technology, including proteomics, which is a field of its own, whereas genomics is like IT. It doesn't do anything, except it enables a proteomics person to sequence the whole bacterial genome, and he knows all the peptides possible by translating into six frames. So even people who use mass spec, if they have a DNA sequence data, they will do it far better than using, imagining these are the proteins present. They usually don't explain. Many proteomics experts get their uh, strain sequence only for this purpose. So for students, genomics in simple terms, our Talaiva, no, the boss, if he says one time, it happens 100 times. In genomics, it can, happens 100 million times. It's, of course, high throughput molecular biology. And you might know in 2005, there was a company called 454. In, they started in Yale University. I went and met them, actually. One of them joined, he's from Chennai, joined Agilent later on. Uh, it's called pyro sequencing. It also happens on a glass slide, but with tiny wells. Each well, a reaction was happening. And the pH was being measured. pH was being measured, actually. And uh, sequencing was happening. Uh, that was, now it is defunct. The, uh, no one is using pyro sequencing after Roche bought it. But this is what is next generation sequencing is all about. You can see these dots. Each dot on a glass slide, you spread your template, basically your template. And then the Sanger sequencing reaction happens on the glass slide. And you measure it after every base addition. So this is called as reversible dye terminator sequencing. Because if everything happens, how do you measure? So every base, it's washed, scanned. Next, dideoxy is added. It washed off. The dideoxy base is also washed off. The block is washed, but the color stays there. You scan, then the color is removed. So it goes under every. That's why if you go Illumina, it will they will say two days to sequence the 50 bases. I wonder why 50 bases. 150 bases takes two days, but you will get millions or billions of spots are being sequenced massively. This is next generation DNA sequencing. So you can sequence the whole genome in a day or the two days time. Uh, many human genomes can be sequenced at ultra low cost. So this revolutionized the whole field. So just showing for students what it is, uh, unlike a chromatogram, this comes in a huge file which your most computers can't even open. They have a sequence ID. Many people would have never seen this. There is a sequence ID, there is sequence, there is quality score, and then quality value. This is called as the fast Q. The Q is the quality. So this became a norm. Now everyone says, please give me fast Q file. I want 10 GB data, right? All these things are coming here. 
is a little journey in genomics. I don't want to go in detail. But in 1998, Sudha and me came back, or we started this company. And 2000, we came back and started off uh, from actually original first from IASC. Um, and then we had our own labs, like what Bhavna said. So it was a, though it sounds too quick, actually it was a tedious process of almost 20 years until until these things came up. The um, new generation of sequencing, which I will very quickly show you what it is. This is the nanopore sequencing technology. This changed everything. This completely changed everything. This is nothing but DNA passing through the pore. And you just imagining if you are doing a voltage, measure the voltage, when there is no DNA, it looks like this. When DNA enters, voltage drops down. And then depending on the basis, you see the wave. And once it goes out, the voltage in the probe goes like this. So this is like Taleva looking at your shadow, he is finding you. This is the shadow of the DNA in an electric field, basically. This is all about nanopore sequencing technology. See, I have the sequencing flow cell in my hands. And I have the sequencer with me. Right here. That's all is the sequencer. You can connect and sequence it from the laptop. Even Sanjeev has one. You can sequence it at home. You can sequence in your car. You can sequence wherever you want. Anywhere and everywhere. This is the um, nanopore sequencing technology. I've started with Sanger and ended with nanopore. So you can see here, this is the shadow. See, there are a lot of data points you can see here. This is the shadow and this is the sequence. Magical, right? And it happens at a speed of 400 basis per second. So I need not wait for too long. You give me a COVID RNA today, now, maybe in the last time I will say whether it is Delta variant or Delta plus variant. That fast. And you can stop and redo. I'm not, I don't want to get inside that. But this has changed the way you will think. And what is the problem with this is, or problem with NGS is, there is too much of data coming. And unless you know how to handle it, which means you have to work on command prompt, that dreaded command prompt, right? No biologists want to use it. I was sitting with Russian coding guys, and I first thing is I want to get out of that room only. Uh, even now, I want to avoid any command line operation. So, what did we do? Again, went to Taleva, and we made a tool called Taleva only. We renamed it as Commander. That you do not need command line to do NGS analysis or genomics. Because if you take anyone who's talking genomics, it's usually a bioinformatics guy. So this is the commander which we uh, we dreamt, we manufactured it, and we are selling. Maybe a few hundred has been sold. Um, commander uh, being used in India. This made all the difference now genomics anyone can do. And my last slide, what is uh, genomics? And where is genomics going? And why genomics has gone ahead of time? See, it has gone so much ahead of time, other technologies have to catch up. I think today you are going to soon hear um, that we have caught up with him, firstly, the inventor, and he will be talking to you. Uh, so, why sequence proteins? You can sequence the whole genome, right? And even proteomics, uh, protein sequencing was lagging behind. People are using mass spec to actually sequence proteins. You want epigenetics? It's not a huge big deal. Now whole genome methylation profiling can be done in no time. See, Avastha Jain, they published the genome of the Parsis. Um, it was done using nanopore. And you can also do methylation profiling while you are doing sequencing also. You want SNPs? It is less than $100 for uh, 
all the SNPs. So what has happened is genomics has went far, far ahead of time, uh, ahead of all other technologies, all other understanding. And uh, proteomics is uh, lagging behind. And uh, I'm sure you are all waiting for the next lecture when proteomics, I think, is catching up with genomics. Uh, I think Jagannath, uh, thank you. We caught you all, uh, just two days back. Uh, thank, thank you for agreeing to uh, talk to us. Uh, over to you, Bhavna, now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raja. Thank you so much. That was a very nice summary of genomics and uh, what genotypic technologies is doing. I mean, it's so happy to uh, to know that, you know, an Indian company uh, is, is doing so well and uh, hopefully it, it becomes global. So on that note, uh, we'll move. Uh, we'll move. I think there is some. OK, yeah. So if you could just stop sharing, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll Oops, yeah. introduce the next last speaker of the day. And um, uh, Dr. Jagannath Swaminathan uh, is the co-founder of, uh, am I pronouncing it correctly? Erisayon? Erisayon. Okay. Yeah. He's the co-founder of Erisayon. And uh, this is, um, I mean, uh, in one of his interviews, I read that this is one of the companies which is going to usher in the new, uh, I mean, the new field of protein sequencing. Uh, I mean, uh, new inventions in protein sequencing. And uh, uh, he is also a research scientist in the lab group of Dr. Edward uh, Market at the University of Texas, Austin, uh, where his uh, Nature Biotech paper of 2018, uh, and it's been described uh, his method of uh, fluorosequencing to be a destructive technology uh, in the field of protein sequencing. And I believe uh, uh, his company is based on this uh, method. And today we'll be hearing uh, uh, more about it. And uh, over to you, Jagannath. And I am very curious to know more about this yeah. technology. Uh, thank you very, very, very much. I feel very honored, privileged, and extremely grateful for having invited me. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kannan and Dr. Raja for tracking me through LinkedIn and, and working this thing out. Uh, I all enjoy the talk. So let me get to my talk. Uh, let's let me just make sure I share my screen. Uh, um, do you see the full screen, the flora sequencing, the title slide? Not yet. Ah, oh, yes, yes. Uh, okay, and the slides moving. Yes. This is the second slide. Okay, fantastic. It's perfect. Uh, okay, yeah, so uh, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, I have to do this in front of any presentation I give. I am currently still a research uh, scientist in Dr. Edward Marcotte's lab at UT Austin, but I'm the co-founder and the shareholder of Erision, and I, it's, uh, I'm trying to balance the two worlds and the two hats together. But uh, the work I'm going to describe today is, uh, is a work that started off my PhD doctoral thesis uh, in 2010. And uh, I've been working on the same idea, same project all this time. And so, uh, and again, like it's not only my work, but it's also a team effort from uh, Dr. Edward Marcotte and some PhD students from Dr. Eric Anselin's lab. Um, so my talk today, um, uh, given the communication I had with Dr. Uh, Kandan and Dr. Raja was, uh, uh, I, uh, mainly to introduce the concept that we have been working on and uh, kind of like just scope out why we did this and also uh, have a few slides about some of the other uh, exciting emerging technologies that people are having in this field. Um, so uh, I, I don't, luckily I don't have to explain what proteins are, so I'll just go ahead and say uh, I, uh, it's not the live code, but uh, proteins seem to do all the work and DNA gets all the glory. So, uh, so why is proteomics hard? Why can't we do something like next-gen DNA sequencing for proteomics? So uh, if you think about DNA and proteins and just try to make a comparison between the RNA and proteins, uh, mRNA has only four nucleotides, proteins have 20 amino acids and hundreds of post-translation modifications. 
uh, DNA has can be amplified uh, or RT-PCR, but for proteins, there is no polymerase to amplify proteins. So you are stuck with the expression levels of proteins that is there. Uh, the third and probably less um, uh, less clear aspect is that the mRNA is uh, readily soluble and it's very e easily extractable. So in the sense that uh, because the RNA and the DNA have like a uh, phosphate backbone, the negative charge makes the solubility uh, not an issue. But uh, uh, when you work in mass spectrometry and the proteomics field, what you encounter is peptides or proteins come with variable solubility, and it's sometimes difficult to extract proteins for any analytical measurement. And uh, finally, one other challenging uh, aspect is the dynamic range that is present in cells or any samples. Um, the RNA, when you do a next-gen uh, RNA sequencing, you have, uh, you have to work with a dynamic range of 10 to the power of four, uh, while for proteins, it can it can be 10 to the power of nine, which in other words, when I say dynamic range, I mean like what's the, abil uh, wh how, what's the expression level of the least abundant uh, species to the most abundant species that is present in the sample. So all these makes things uh, difficult uh, for proteomics, uh, but uh, back in the, uh, when we started the project, we started thinking, how do we uh, take analogy some, um, thoughts from next-gen DNA sequencing for proteomics. So we wanted a very parallelizable system, just like DNA sequencing, next-gen DNA sequencing is done, and, and think about it for the biomolecule, uh, uh, for protein biomolecules. Uh, so the first method uh, was sequencing by synthesis, which people do in the DNA sequencing field. Unfortunately, again, like no PCR for protein, so we, could, we cannot imagine something like that. Um, the second method, uh, and uh, thank you, Raja, for introducing, uh, uh, talking about the sequencing by hybridization. There are methods in proteins like aptamers and affinity reagents that people use for identifying proteins, but it comes with serious limitations because you need to know a priori what the affinity reagent should target. So if there is a new phosphate modification, you have to design a new affinity reagent for that. So it's not a very scalable approach. Uh, the third approach is nanopore or tunneling uh, uh, pores. And I'll talk about a little bit about that in the end. Uh, we think it is viable, but they too come with extremely intrinsically challenges. One major challenge I want to highlight is uh, the size difference between a protein and uh, a DNA, even like 50 base pair DNA, is humongous. Like uh, it's uh, it's a nanomole, a nanometer for a single for a myoglobin, but 50 base pairs or 20 base pairs will will be that size. So when you talk about like a DNA and RNA transcript and a protein being formed, it is actually multiple orders of magnitude difference. So the size difference should be considered as well when you think about proteins. And finally, the sequencing by degradation is the type of strategy we came uh, we uh, thought through, and uh, that involves uh, stealing some bits from mass spec, some, uh, and most importantly, a very old technology called the Edmund degradation call it old, but uh, uh, Dr. Cannon just described uh, the work by Fred Sanger, so it's not very old. Um, so um, yeah, so the next part is just going to be this idea of floral sequencing, where the concepts are shared some results from the Nature Biotech paper, and just a slide about some of the advances we have done in sample preparation method for our technology. Um, so at the very heart of it, uh, the the basic concept is that unlike DNA sequencing, where there are uh, four base pairs, there is so many more amino acids to be uh, that there are present. And so just kind of like tagging all of them is probably not practical. So that we came up on this idea that maybe if we know just the positions of few amino acid residues in a peptide backbone, that information is typically sufficient to identify what the protein is. So the 
uh, the information content of uh, of a proteome is actually uh, like undersampled in the uh, in the sense that there is a lot more structure to the uh, to the proteome. So, uh, for instance, in this example, if I know the words of O, uh, uh, like all the other letters, and just fill in O, then I can clearly find out what the uh, protein is. So it's a hybrid approach of trying to identify the positions of few amino acid residues and also using a reference database generated through RNA sequencing or standard databases to identify what the protein is in the sample. Um, and uh, the very first question is that, is there sufficient information? So back in 2014, we did this uh, simulation where we asked like, uh, if we, for instance, if we know the positions of uh, four amino acids, lysine, aspartic, and glutamic acids, uh, tyrosine, and tryptophan, and then you know what is the site that uh, cut at the C terminus. So this is just a theory. Um, for instance, like cyanogen bromide and cleave at methionines, then we find that there is 98% uh, of all the proteins in a theoretical human proteome has at least one peptide that can be uniquely identified. So some, uh, uh, so uh, the idea is that a partial sequence, a partial composition of amino acids with a position is sufficient to make these types of protein inferences. Um, so uh, to enable this technology, we uh, have three basic components to it. Uh, the first one is a selective amino acid labeling. So this is a, these are chemistry tools that we have developed and mo mostly we have stolen from what Mossback and other organic chemists have done over many decades, which is um, a method of targeting different amino acids. So many of the functional amino acids like lysines, tryptophans, they can be labeled with fluorescent dyes. Uh, the second component is uh, the single molecule microscopy. So this, has, this is a type of technology uh, that has improved dramatically over the years, thanks sometimes to the work from next-gen DNA sequencing. But uh, there is a class of microscopes that is now out there where you can do single protein detection in cells um, and methods have been improved on high resolution microscopy. Um, we use what is called the total internal reflection fluorescence microscopy. And this is a, uh, this is a method of uh, uh, capturing sig fluorescent signal at an extremely high signal to background uh, noise at the glass water interface. So just that the surfaces immobilized fluorescent molecules can be very clearly seen and quantitated. And then the third aspect is, is a, like a pushback to the years of 1950s where this, old, uh, this technology called the Edmund degradation came about. And this method is a sequential removal of one amino acid per cycle, and it leaves the rest of the peptide backbone intact. Um, over the many decades, people have actually optimized this chemistry uh, of Edmund degradation, and the methodology is um, is uh, very elegant. So the peptide has uh, is uh, reacts the end terminus of peptide reacts with the basic uh, under basic conditions with this molecule called the phenyl isothiocyanate. Uh, it conjugates to it, and under acidic condition, the first amino acid pops off. So historically, people would take what is popped off and run it through uh, uh, maybe fluorescently tag or stabilize it or run it through a HPLC column. And the retention time would tell you what that amino acid uh, what, uh, is uh, that got cleaved off. And so you would repeat this process a number of times and you could actually uh, build a de novo sequence of it. So we, uh, it was interesting in the early days, I would read like the papers of the 50s and the 60s to understand how people did this Edmund degradation because nobody seems to be doing it, doing it these days. Um, so uh, just to again, like uh, uh, put it in perspective, what we do is we take these fluorescently labeled peptide population uh, and immobilize them on a glass slide. 
And now this, uh, we dilute them and in such a manner that when you look at the glass slide through the microscope, it looks like stars on a dark night. So every single spot is a single peptide molecule and they have uh, fluorescently tagged amino acids. Uh, the positions of it is not yet known, but we know that there is signal from each peptide. And each peptide is different from the next peptide because it has a different characteristic positions of amino acid residues. And we immobilize all these peptides via the C-terminus. Um, and then we take images across different channels. So if you imagine all the cysteines got a red fluorophore, all the lysines got a blue fluorophore, and you say do it for four different fluorophores, you can uh, you take a snapshot and then we then I have a small animation, I hope it plays. Um, yeah, so we take a snapshot of this uh, star, starry field, and then we do this Edmund degradation where it cuts one amino acid at a, at a time. So the first cycle, tryptophan signal got away, like uh, reduce, dimmed. And that is an indication of what that amino acid is. You uh, progress along these cycles. If there is no change, we just mark it as X unknown and and then at the last step, we sequence match to a database to uh, reference what the protein is. So this is the fundamental nature of uh, the, the concept of the technology. Um, oh, it's playing again. Yeah, so uh, in the paper, again, like it's slightly dated and I apologize for uh, not being able to provide you with some of the latest data. Um, but you'll get a feel for uh, how the data looks and how we interpret it. Uh, remember, what we did is we take samples, label them, uh, and uh, put it on a glass slide. But the, uh, but the transition from labeling to putting it on a glass slide is actually just a series of dilutions. And we dilute the sample by six orders of magnitude. So whatever mass spec sees, we actually take the same sample, dilute it, uh, uh, for our uh, sequencing, partial sequencing uh, method. It's kind of like some people also call it fingerprinting, which I think is a good analogy as well, because we map the positions of it. Um, in this slide, what you're seeing is, uh, what we did is we took two peptides very close to, uh, very similar in the composition, but the positions of cysteines are different. And uh, through the process of the floral sequencing, we can actually analytically discriminate the two populations of these uh, peptide molecules. Uh, similarly, we show uh, a, a proof of concept of discriminating uh, peptides that are much more closely spaced together and, uh, and, uh, and uh, discriminate. Uh, the the goal and uh, uh, and the other interesting aspect of this is uh, each one of these uh, the way you interpret this is it's the it's the step drop and the positions at which the step drop happens and uh, the uh, the counts tell you actually the counts of the molecules so it is it is a, it's like a counting statistics of actually applying molecule uh, counting molecules to get quantitation. Um, so this is, uh, and then uh, we actually, I'm, I'm, this is from the paper too, we actually ch ch picked up insulin and, uh, and as a one, as a homage to Dr. Sanger. And the second one, we actually thought it would, uh, we would have enough of uh, material to try out this labeling and it's relatively a simple uh, uh, protein. So what we do is we digest it with glucy. So the terminal residues are always ending with the glutamic acid or the C-terminus. And then we immobilize them on the surface. And then we sequence, like we label the cysteine residues. And we can actually discriminate the different positions of the, uh, of the cysteine residues and in, in, a, in a constructed way. Um, uh, it is it's kind of like a mapping the positional inference of uh, insulin. Um, so uh, I, I'll just leave it with this. We have been making more, uh, uh, a lot more optimization, a lot more effort has been gone uh, through the company uh, to take this whole technology and run with it. One of the important things is that we have now been able to expand the labeling set. So just not only cysteine, but we can label six different amino acid types and we have 
um, the fluorophores for labeling four different fluorophores. So the complexity of the samples is improving. Uh, we are also working on the informatics so that just like how mass spec informatics works with uh, determining how statistically significant a read is. Uh, similarly, there are a lot of efforts trying to make sure that what results we get is, uh, is, um, is statistically sound and significant. Um, and then the, uh, this one slide I just put in, because uh, if you uh, remember or uh, if you recall, like the way we uh, attack this problem is we need to label peptides with fluorophores. And one problem we encounter is when we try to label amino acids with fluorophores, we run into some practical limitations like uh, reaction efficiencies and so forth. So we wanted to, and also uh, the nature that the fluorophores tend to reside uh, uh, or stick non-specifically to the surface. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that we can get rid of all the fluorophores and increase our reaction efficiencies and conditions. So we uh, came up with this method of a solid phase peptide capture where uh, peptides will be captured through their end terminus through this molecule called the uh, pyridine carboxyaldehyde and it does not touch the lysine residue. So only the end terminal of peptides, they get conjugated onto solid supports. So once they are in solid supports, it's actually much more easier to handle them to uh, perform reactions, label uh, amino acids, change the pH, uh, and do all those kinds of uh, uh, important condition alterations to improve the reaction uh, yields. Uh, and then the final thing that we uh, learned to do was we also uh, uh, used, um, we learned how to completely deprotect the end terminus. So this, this whole pipeline for trying to uh, capture proteins right at the start onto a solid support so that we can do, uh, and it's a covalent bond, so we can do all kinds of washes and labeling and then release it for sequencing. Um, so uh, that's that's kind of like where we are with uh, with regards to the floral sequencing technology. We uh, have a paper right now in press about uh, uh, working out a method for uh, discriminating the C from the internal amino acids. There's still a lot of uh, uh, time and effort that is needed to take this to a box that we are uh, planning to build and sell it. And uh, hopefully in the year 2022, 2023, we should be uh, out in the market. That's our um, optimistic hope here. Um, I'll just spend a couple of slides just talking about some of the other uh, emerging technologies that are out there. You've already seen our floral sequencing. I'm um, sorry, I forgot to put the reference, but uh, this is a, a very new nature methods paper that talks about a review of the emerging single molecule technologies. Um, and I would recommend you to have a look at it. Um, the, um, the second type of method that's kind of like uh, getting Again, like there is no preliminary data yet on other methods for proteome wide or uh, a lot of like beyond just toy examples like ours um, to the entire like competing with mass specs or new applications. But so, but these are early days of uh, technology development. So this particular technology, what we, the, what people call sequencing by N terminal probes, is uh, engineering affinity reagents that are very selective for the N-terminal amino acids. So uh, it is, um, you can think about some of the uh, proteoexopeptidases that are very selective for the met uh, methionines, for instance. So there are a handful of these probes that are produced by bacteria that actually recognize these uh, N-terminal uh, amino acids, and they use this to differentially uh, uh, fluorescently label them. So you can imagine uh, you add a fluorophore, say a lysine recog gets recognized on a peptide on a glass slide, uh, you perform, you uh, say, okay, lysine, and then you perform an admin step, and then you go in and say cysteines and so forth. Uh, and then one amino acid, and so you build out a sequence. Uh, there are a couple of issues. Uh, one, one major one is that uh, Practically, 
uh, developing 20 different, um, 20 or more than that for PPMs is going to be challenging. And it's not very clear how well the discrimination is between the side chain of the internal amino acid and something internal within it. Um, these two are some very exciting work in the in kind of like detectors and of mass spec. Uh, what they have done in this particular uh, work is the, the detector is actually a little loaded spring. And so it is so sensitive that a peptide or a protein molecule falling on it actually can be measured. And, and these are mass induced shifts of these uh, little springs. That, uh, that tell you what the mass of that protein is, and that can be used to calculate what the, um, uh, what the identity of the protein could be. So very early days, but this is like, uh, it's, it's very fantastic physics uh, that's happening. Uh, the other interesting uh, uh, work that I saw was that uh, people are actually, uh, Oxford Nanopore, the lights who made the uh, nanopore technology for DNA sequencing. They're actually uh, funding a lot of research for sticking a, ox, uh, a nanopore right in front of a mass spec. And there are detectors that are single, um, single molecule detectors for mass spec that's being used. And uh, people are trying to see if you can engineer the nanopore with an exopeptidase so that the liberated amino acids can actually be detected by mass spec. So uh, I thought it was pretty interesting work that's, uh, that's been uh, going on in, some, in, in the university at Brown. Um, uh, this uh, set of, uh, uh, um, uh, this set of examples of some of the emerging technologies is in the nanopore world. Um, there, uh, nanopore is fantastic. If it works, it'll be revolutionary. The one challenge that unlike DNA, the protein world, uh, uh, a fields for nanopore is, is A, the 20 amino acid, and B, I told you like how big the size gap is between the protein and the DNA. So engineering tinier pores is actually their biggest challenge. So they are trying to make pores that are 10 angstroms in length so that you can actually have only a single D, uh, protein strand that passes through it. Uh, a number of hybrid approaches are also being taken where you label a, a few amino acids just like how we did for the fluorescent tags. You can think about putting some electronic tags so that there is some change in the uh, nano, uh, in the flow rate or the voltage difference as different amino acids thread through the pores. And uh, finally, there are some work that uh, are done with, uh, with the whole protein and how how with what affinity it binds to the pore as a way of detecting the shape, the volume uh, of the different proteins. And that could be an indicator to indicate what are the proteins that's present in the sample. Uh, and finally, uh, I just leave this here because this is the only uh, work I got, uh, which is a pattern from um, uh, of this type of technology. So imagine the DNA's uh, pack bio system where, or, where there are millions of these wells. What they are trying to do is they are trying to Im uh, immobilize a protein or a peptide molecule per well and a single peptide molecule per well and have an, a fluorescently labeled N-terminal exopeptidase. And these exopeptidase based on the retention time and the affinity to bind will give you a signal of what amino acid could be present. And, and they are hoping that, that this um, information is what is being uh, translated and can be either used to infer what the proteins could be. Again, they run into some of the same challenges as dynamic range of uh, proteomes to um, building these uh, sets of exopeptidases. Um, yeah, and so I, I'll leave you with this one uh, memorable slide of mine, which is this is the microscope that uh, that we built uh, initially. Uh, what you are seeing here is uh, a classic microscope. We put just to uh, just to cover all the light. We put a cardboard box. What you see here is actually the reagents for Edmund degradation, and they have to be filled with nitrogen. And so we have like little nitrogen filled balloons 
on these class on these uh, containers and this is the type of instrument that was a very first one uh, our later instruments are going to be much more streamlined with, with the push button all right that's that's my talk thank you so much for the time yeah Thank you so much, Jagannath. That was fantastic on uh, single molecule protein sequencing. And we've come a full circle here, starting with Sanger's micromole uh, sequencing to zeptomole sequencing of the same insulin. So it was fabulous. Uh, and uh, I think uh, if there are any questions uh, from the audience, uh, we can take them now. If not, I, I have a question. No, I can, I, like can I ask something? Yes, yeah, yes, sure, yes, sure. yes, yes, Dr. Molidhar, please go ahead. Uh, either Sanjeev Galande or uh, Jagannath or anybody, how do we detect uh, using some of these so called micro sequencing methods tyrosine O sulfate? I know LCMS can do. We discovered this post translation modification in hormones, pituitary hormones, first in the world. The point is that uh, there are 240 post transcription modifications. Do we have methods by these recent technologies to detect any of them other than phosphorylation? I just wanted to know. I am a retired person. It is of no use to me. Yeah. So I'll just, it may help uh, younger people. Yeah, I, I'll drop a line and then I can let uh, the others comment. Uh, if from our technology, it is going to be extremely challenging. Uh, we typically just do this 80-20 rule of like, which are the most prominent modifications and, and we are just targeting that. If there are chemistry tools that enable labeling covalently of any of these modifications specifically, please let me know. I will be excited to follow it up. The second is a request through Kannan. I'm going to conduct a refresher course for Indian Academy of Sciences in a small university in Andhra Pradesh called Adhikavi Nannaya University. <coughs> okay, It's a funded uh, refresher course for 14 days. The theme is on proteins, structure, function, and evolution. Can I request some of you to speak of course it is a webinar uh, at maybe after a couple of months later after the covid days but online only can i make a request sure 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 we'll we'll see how best we can organize help you it goes without saying murli you don't have to ask for all these things no 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 we are busy people no it's okay we'll busy find people. a slot for you no but we'll find a slot Thank you very much. You are asking and, uh, very serious questions. So. Congrats to all the speakers. Very good uh, meeting. I learned a lot. I think it's a model which I think most of the industry should take care. The only thing that I find a little bit uh, deficiency, I don't know the audience here. I think Kanan started with this philosophy of being uh, translatable as an educative material, supplementary education. So I think you have to come down a little bit yeah. and explain each of these instrumentation or chemistry so that the audience who are you know, maybe undergraduate students or PG students, they will uh, really appreciate. As a research uh, seminar, of course, these are all outstanding, updating all the recent advances, extremely yeah. good and useful. Uh, Professor Murli, uh, actually, yeah. this was only a icebreaker. Uh, you know, Raja is planning uh, one series of four week, one one week, explaining each one and yeah, people yeah. participating the workshop. So that like that, we so. are planning that. That's how we are planning that. You know, today we just wanted to show them the no, uh, no, it's very diversity. Good. But tomorrow, you know, as we, as time permit, we will work out a program. Am I right, Raja, to say that that to do? You know, piece by piece. How level do you advertise? Well, we haven't. How do you advertise? We'll, we'll let you know. I mean, we haven't had. We just there's a concept. No, no, so. not only me. Uh, there are uh, many colleagues in uh, remote places in India, Central University of Bihar, Central University of Jammu, 
mm. i think it's good to reach them some sure. of the younger faculty mm. this is a very good educative material and yeah. this proteins is the biggest field i'm very happy about it it has come back very strong yeah this is Thank the you. backbone for biochemistry actually <laughs> i agree Thank you very much, all the speakers. Congrats. Yeah. So I think, Bhavana, it's your job to. Yes, I, I just had one question for Jagannath if it's time, if there's time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. Yes. So I, uh, it, it's a fascinating technology. I was just wondering that um, uh, how much of secondary structures affect your sequencing? For instance, if you were to do a low complexity domain sequences uh, because right now there is this concept of you know uh, there being phase separation and that being driving you know most of your uh, 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 function in the cells and these being driven by the low complexity domains in the proteins and more and more proteins are having these lcrs so how how good will your technology be for that sequencing or do you have any adaptations in mind for that um so um, the, the, the technology is primarily for the primary sequence. So secondary sequences are going to, is kind of like beyond the scope. But at the same time, there are these interesting cross-linking strategies that people have. So if one can adapt a cross-linker and then do the proteolysis, uh, uh, then it's still amenable to sequencing. And then maybe you can do comparisons to find out how the structure could have been. So that is my thought on that. OK, yeah, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, and uh, if there are no more questions, then uh, I mean, what more can I say? It's been such a fantastic uh, I mean, series of talks on genomics, emerging field of proteomics. And, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Kannan and Dr. Raja for putting all of this together and to be asking me to be the moderator. I learned so much today. So thank you so much. And uh, I, I think I'd just like to end with one uh, one thing that, uh, I mean, so many of uh, Professor Kannan's students are here today. So it just goes on to uh, say such a good mentor he is. I mean, so many of his students are doing so well uh, in academia, in industry, not just in India, but all over the world. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Kannan, for this. And uh, um, I'm sure I think if you organize more such series, several of your students can speak on many such topics. Sure, so sure, sure, it's going sure. to be a never ending uh, series. Yes, that yes. Is. <laughs> thank so you so much. Good. I think I must Good. thank Bhavana as moderator, and Raja, and uh, Jagannath, and Sanjeev for sparing their valuable time. Not easy to get, and uh, probably you know, Raja always is very good popular with the students, you know, the kind of Talaiwa jokes he puts and Talaiwa <laughs> in the this thing, you know, he adds a bit of a movie-like situation, I think. I think it was a fantastic day. Sorry, uh, it took more than two hours because what happened originally, if I had to be, if Jagannath wasn't their speaker, if he hadn't agree, we'd have finished it on time. But his coming was a big boon. So last moment we announced, that is why, sorry for this extended time, but I think mm -hmm. he, he really told us where we are heading, you know, that is more important, you know. So I think it's a great and 100th year of discovery of insulin as a treatment, I think it was a great tribute today that he also, Jagannath also closed it with insulin by the new method, I think it's fantastic. Thank you so much, each one of you, all my friends and students and my colleagues who joined in, of course, Professor Murli there, I always take it for granted. So I don't even like to say thank you to him. <laughs> because he has been a mentor of mine for very many. Nice to see Shiva Kumar, Usha Sabma, and all these people. So thank you once again. Yeah. Till next time. Okay. See Have a nice day. Bye. 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 Yeah. Huh.